Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're in chapter 5, and uh, we broke into it last week, and uh, the good news is we're actually going to finish off chapter 5 today uh, because we have a lot of work to do in chapter 6, which is coming next week. Uh, We're going to be there for several weeks, and so uh, we're going to get through chapter 5 today. We left off at verse 6, so we're going to just circle back to 5 and 6 to set the stage briefly. And this is what we read. So also Mashiach did not glorify himself to become Kohen Gadol, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Moving on to verse 7, this is what we read. Who in the days of his flesh... Now, what does he mean by who in the days of his, he's referring to Yeshua when he was here. When the word became flesh, he's referring to Yeshua in his earthly ministry. When he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Now, here the writer, once again, he appeals to the humanity of Yeshua. The exact opposite thing that a Gnostic would do. He appeals, he's showing the hum, that Christ came in the flesh. And it's so imperative. And this, kind of, this, this, this statement is a reflection off of Hebrews 4.15. Where he says, we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with us, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. Point, he was tempted in all points as we were. In other words, he came in a garment of flesh. The things that we have experienced, he too has experienced. And now he brings this, this the, he appeals to his humanity again and shows that what he did by going to the cross was absolutely agonizing for him. He had fear, he had anxiety, all of these things that we're accustomed to in the flesh, he dealt with, he had to fight. I mean, this statement is taken right out of Matthew 26, Matthew 27. You think of the prayer that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He doesn't pray the prayer once. He doesn't pray it twice. He prays it three times because he's in anguish. He has so much anxiety. There's fear. If there's any other way, make it happen, Father. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And then ultimately, he goes to the cross, and one of the most amazing things about as he's on the cross is what he says. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, or azavtani in Hebrew. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's literally turning the people back to Psalm 22. Why he's on the cross? This is how the psalm opens up. The most amazing thing about that psalm, as you go on, the Lord hears him. Here's his prayer, and we'll pick it up. We'll go to Psalm 22, verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. You have answered me. And so the beginning of the psalm, Eli, Eli, Lama Azavtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's crying out with vehement cries. He's crying out to his father, and guess what? The father hears. And what happened? He rose him from the grave. And so when we look at this statement that the writer of Hebrews is making here, he was heard because of his godly fear. I mean, this is this goes back to Scripture. This goes back to the reality that Yeshua rose from the dead. Moving on to verse 8. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Again, we jumped ahead. We are, we've already covered this passage. But just to reiterate, he's not talking about disobedient, chastising as a father has to chastise their son, they have to learn obedience. You know, we know our children must learn obedience, and they do that when we punish them. This is how they learn obedience. When they do something wrong, you know what? You're going to face consequences. This is not what this passage is saying. What this passage is saying is Yeshua experienced what it was like to obey God in his will in the flesh. And Yeshua did it perfectly. But he experienced all the fears, the anxiety, and guess what else he experienced? Pain. Horrific pain, horrific suffering, which he experienced on the cross. Moving on to verse 9. And having been perfected, and you look at this in the Greek, it really, 
it, it comes from telos, okay, which means goal. And, and in other words, that this term, uh, teleo, it, it refers to uh, reaching the goal or coming and accomplishing that which is set forth. And so, having been perfected, Yeshua became, now look at this statement, the author of eternal salvation. Let that sink in. Because the writer just turned all eyes. All emphasis is put on Yeshua for salvation. He is the only one that we can receive it. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. It is only the name of Yeshua. And here's why that's important. Because today in churches right now, there are pastors telling you that's not true. They're literally telling you this is not true. They're taking the emphasis off of where the writer right here is putting where it belongs. And they're creating different avenues. Let me share with you an article. I want to share an article. I got this just a, a week or two ago. Came across my desk in regard to one of the most influential pastors, megachurch pastors, in New York City. And this is, and this is a snapshot of the web. I, I'm going to show you the snapshot of this article. This is what it said. And you, you may not be able to read this, but I'll put this up larger. Saying you're going to hell if you don't believe in Jesus is insanity. Mega church pastor Michael A. Walron Jr. says. I mean, this is real. This is not a joke. Goes on and says this. There was a time when you would see people in the pulpit say, well, if you don't believe in Yeshua, you're going to hell. That's insanity. In many ways, because that is not what Jesus even believes. And so the key is you believe in God. And whatever your path to God, whatever your path is to God, I celebrate that. This is being spoken from a pulpit. And it, listen, even Jesus, he, I mean, that's insanity because in many, in many ways that is not what Jesus even, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what he said. Now look at what he goes on to say. Again, we have enough in this world that divides us. We need to find those things that bring us together. Wasn't well, that nice and ecumenical? And if God cannot bring us closer together, then something is wrong. Not with God, but in how we think we know God and understand God. In other words, if something is prohibiting unity from getting people to join us in church like Jesus, move him aside. We don't want to inhibit anything from joining us together. If Jesus is dividing us from the world, when the problem is with us and our thought on how we should be saved, this is what he's saying. How insane is this? You think about what is being spoken in here, and it is frightening. I want to take you to 2 Peter, because he has something to say about this. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. And what will they do? Even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. That's prophecy. And you're living it right now. And so when we look at the writer of Hebrews and he says, Yeshua is the author of eternal salvation, understand the implications of that and the weight of that statement. There is no other way. Yeshua says, I am the door of the sheep. You try to come in another way, you are a thief and a robber. And you know what happens to thief and robbers? They're going to be destroyed. There's no other way. There's no other name we can call on. It is him. And so the writer rightly puts the emphasis on him. He is the author of eternal salvation. But here's what's interesting. Unlike what we just read with this pastor who, who, who looks at this and, you know what, we, it doesn't need to be so isolated just to Yeshua, just to Jesus. No, no. There are many paths. This sounds like an Oprah Winfrey show. Right? There are many ways you can get there. No, no. And here's what's interesting. The writer goes the opposite direction. It isn't just narrowed to those who confess Jesus. It's more narrow than that. It's more select than that. He goes on and says, to those who obey him. Amen. To those who obey him. That's where we're at. This is the reality. You want salvation? You must obey him. You know what's terrifying? Is when you actually start to go read the words of Jesus, Yeshua, 
And then think about, I'm supposed to obey that? I'm supposed to do that? That's when terror should come over you. That's when, you know, who you are as a person gets ripped apart. Deception gets thrown to the side. When you literally put the words of Yeshua up to your life and where you're at. It is humbling. And so to help us with this, to add some humility to us, I'm going to show you some of the things that Yeshua said. And keep in mind that only those who obey him will see eternal life. And we'll start here in Matthew 5, 20. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You will never see it. This is an ultimatum. Your righteousness must exceed the, the righteousness of the very ones that are respected by the community. The ones that exalted, the ones that have devoted their lives to religion, to the faith, to, Yesh to, well, to Yeshua. Think about that. Now, we could argue, you know, Yeshua doesn't treat kindly the scribes and Pharisees, and that is correct. Why? Because they were whitewashed tombs. They looked beautiful on the outside. And everything they did to be seen by men and to receive the acknowledgement and glory from men. But their hearts were not right. And we got to take away from that, that reality, that it's not enough for you to go to church and to look all prim and proper. It's not enough for you to wear the right clothes, say the right things. What, what you are going to need is you're going to have to have righteousness of the heart. You're going to have to be pure in heart. Going to Matthew 6.15. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. One of the hardest things Yeshua brings to the table for us to practically, in real life, walk out. See, because true forgiveness is not simply going to the Lord and saying, you know, Lord, you know, I've had issues with this person, but you know what? I forgive them. But if your heart still has hatred and bitterness, you're deceived. This is what's so frightening about this. When it says you forgive, that's talking, it begins in here. It begins in the heart. And from the heart, you really mean it. Lord, I forgive them. Don't hold it. And you know what? Yeshua helps you. He gives you a little motivation knowing that you don't do this, you are dead. You will have no forgiveness. And this is a motivation for me. I can tell you that. This motivation has catapulted me to seriously say, you know what? I need to wash my hands of this. I need to be done with this, and I need to pray for that person. I need to be able to do that, or I might as well forget it. There's going to be no atonement for me. Unless you obey the words of Yeshua, you'll never see eternal life. Matthew 18, 3. This is the third ultimatum in a row. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and has become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You need to have that childlike faith. Who a child in their heart... They're not double-minded. You tell them some to believe this, and it is. It just is. We need to be those kind of people. Regardless of what we see happening in the world, our faith is not moved. We have a childlike faith. We know Yeshua is coming soon. It's going to be okay. This is where we need to be. Matthew 5, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. This goes right along with you. You've got to forgive men their trespasses. Are we to that point where we can love our enemies? Have you reached that point in your heart? Do you have it in your heart? I'm going to tell you, if you don't have that in your heart where you can get there, we have problems. This is what's so scary when, when the writer of author says, the writer of Hebrews says that, the, that Yeshua is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. You have to obey his words. I mean, frightening. I mean, you start going through these passages, and, and, and if we're honest, you find out, whoa, I am a long way away from the faith. I'm a long way away from being perfected. I'm a long way away from allowing Yeshua to enter into my heart and to completely take over and leave nothing behind. That's true freedom. That's true liberty. When you're giving your whole heart to the Lord Yeshua. And then he says this as we continue just a couple verses later. Therefore you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We are called to perfection. We are called to be like our Father in heaven. Now all I hear today is all the excuses why we're not. And that's what we give ourselves. We continue to lie to ourselves. 
Matthew 10, 37. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I'm going to tell you right now, I have seen people that have been confronted with situations with their own children where they had slid aside, and this is what's so terrifying, they compromised the faith, they compromised what they knew was right in the commandments of God for the sake of their children. And you can find biblical examples of this, such as with Eli the priest. He exalted his kids higher than the Lord, and the Lord took out his family, took him out. Now, you think about these things, that it had, the love has to be this great, or you're not going to get in. Nothing can inhibit it. That's not to say we're not to love our children. But if you're doing so at the compromise of the faith in any way in his commandment, we have a problem. Doesn't work. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I has, have loved you, that you love one another. Think about that kind of love. The love has to be, it has to mirror the very love Yeshua has given us. We have to love each other that way. And again, I ask you, are we living to the standard? If we're honest, we'll say, no, we're not. We are not where we need to be in the faith. When you start looking at the words of Yeshua and the things that he said, and let's not forget what else he said. Remember what we read in Matthew 19, and the rich young man, he comes to him, says, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? He says, keep the commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. See, if we do not keep them, we will not enter in. This is a reality. Going back and continuing on in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10. Called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, and look at this, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain. In other words, and listen to me carefully, what the writer is saying is, listen, I have to bring Melchizedek to the table. We need to talk about this guy. But the things that I have to say about him, they're so profound, they're so spiritually deep. I don't know how I'm going to do this. It's going to be hard to explain to you. You know why? Well, he tells us, since you have become dull of hearing. He wants to share the deeper things of the word, and he's going to as we get to Hebrews chapter 7, and we've already got a taste of that last week. He wants to do this, but this is his concern. They become dull of hearing. In the Greek, that word for dull, I want to put it up here, it's nothros. The inflected form is nothroi, if you were to go to the manuscript, but nothros, it literally means lazy. Some of the translations utilize that term. They have become spiritually lazy. They have become sluggish, complacent. This is a pivotal moment in this epistle. Pivotal moment. Because up to this point, guess what? These Jewish believers were not formally challenged or accused or rebuked in any way. But now that door has been burst wide open. The writer has opened that door. And this is what's fascinating. When you step back and you look at this epistle as a whole, you're going to realize something. This epistle is a full-out intervention. That's what it is. This Jewish believer, this writer of Hebrews, is so he's concerned about his brethren. And it's not about things that, you know, well, we can agree to disagree. We can do that. No, this is life and death. These are life and death situations, and this is a life and death situation. Something is wrong. Something is wrong with them. There's a spiritual deformity. They are not growing. And we continue on in verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. In other words, the first principle, this is elementary. The things that are the most elementary, you have come to need. You've come to need milk and not solid food. This is the problem. They should be teachers by now. And you know what? They're spiritual babies. They're little spiritual infants. Now, Considering the importance of this statement, 
we're going to spend a little bit of time here because there's a lot that I believe that needs to be drawn out of this statement, especially when you consider where this modern-day progressive church is and the kind of Christians it is cultivating in, in today's society. And so the first thing I want to mention here is that, you know what, when, when we're confronted with an analogy, this is an analogical statement where you have, we need milk and, and not solid food, that's the time for you to sit back and ponder. What does he mean by milk and not solid food? Well, see, because he's using terms, and this is, it's a beautiful and powerful teaching tool, to take spiritual concepts, render them down into the physical realm, something that's tangible and relatable to everyone in the audience, where they can just relate to it and it brings greater clarity and understanding to what is being communicated. And that's what he does here with these terms. And so he utilizes the terms milk and solid food. What is the writer really getting at? He's getting at human development. Think about this. Human development. As something that every, every single one of us can understand. We go out in society, we go to the malls, we go to, the, we go to church, we go all these different places, and you see children. You see infants. And you also see adults. What do we know about infants? Real simple. Infants need milk. That's how they survive. And infants are, 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 are interesting. Because when you think about them, they're in a completely vulnerable state. And this is important that you understand this. And, and what this, this analogical statement that the writer is utilizing here. And how that crosses over into the spiritual realm. And to where these particular group of Jewish believers are at. See, an infant cannot even change its own clothes. It can't change its own diaper. It cannot handle things. It cannot, it virtually cannot even feed itself. It's completely in a vulnerable state. It relies solely on the mother to nourish it. And that milk is important because what it does is it, 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 it creates, it builds this strong immune system. Right? It builds up that. It creates brain function. It builds their brain. It starts to, it, to grow healthy. They become stronger. And over time, it's what you call they begin to develop. This is what happens. They begin to develop. And eventually you see them one day and they're adult. And they don't need anyone to change them. They don't need anyone to feed them. Actually, they've come to the point where they're responsible. They're not just responsible for themselves, but now they care for others. There's a reason the writer is utilizing this specific analogy is because it works absolutely perfectly. And when you bring this into the spiritual realm, he's dealing with the fact that these, these Jewish, particular Jewish believers, they're little infants. The expectation was is that they would have grown by now. Something's wrong. Could you imagine if, if you've seen, uh, you know, you, you have a child, and, and you know, I've had four of them, and you bring your little baby home, and it's a precious time. And, and again, this is a crossover moment. That one of the most beautiful experiences you will ever have in your life is with the birth of a new child. I mean, it really is, and it's such a beautiful time. It's no different when a new believer comes into the faith and calls upon the name of Yeshua. It is beyond precious. But to have that infant never grow, I mean, could you imagine, you, we can joke tongue-in-cheek and say, you know what, I'm going to buy this infant a, you know, a pair of shoes, and this is going to be awesome, you're going to wear them for 20 years. No, they're not. And my wife was buying multiple shoes because they're going to grow. The expectation is your infant is going to grow, and they're going to need these things because they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Understand something. This is what the writer is saying. There is but one expectation for someone that comes into the faith, confesses the Messiah Yeshua, and that is growth. There's one expectation, pure and simple. With that said, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to show you a little deeper dimension to this statement. Because Paul ironically enough, says the exact same thing to the Corinthians that the writer of Hebrews is saying to these particular group of Jewish believers. And it's the exact same thing, only Paul uses a, one specific word that's a little different, and so he rounds out the whole concept very nicely. And this is what we read. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, 
as to babes in Christ. So that same rebuke that the writer of Hebrews came against his brother, here you have Paul, a Jew, rebuking the Gentiles. He is rebuking them. You are babes and Messiah. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. Something is wrong. You have not grown. What was wrong? What is the problem? Paul tells us, for you are still carnal. That's the key. You are still carnal. Do you want to prohibit spiritual growth? Become carnal. It will inhibit growth every single time. And what is carnality? What does it mean to be carnal? It means to be in your flesh. It means that you're now devoting more time, your passions, your desires, your thoughts, to things of the world, to your flesh, to what satisfies the flesh. A carnal mind will tell you, you know what? You don't need to fast and pray. It's okay. You really don't need that. A carnal mind will tell you, you know what? You, you, you kind of said a prayer yesterday. It's, it's not the end of the world. If you pray right now, though you're even feeling it, you know what? Because you've got a lot of things going on. A carnal mind will tell you, you know what? I'm just going to go watch TV instead of sit down and read the word of God. You see what the carnal mind is? And this is the problem. It will prohibit growth. And this is not an issue Where you can just say, well, it's not that big of a deal. We're not talking about internal implications. Trust me when I say this. Yes, we are. And I know this from the book of Hebrews. I know this from the Apostle Paul. And looking at the the, the Corinthians. You know, when a believer falls into this trap. Into a trap of complacency and, and, and stagnation. Where they become spiritually lazy. Someone has to sound the shofar. Someone has to sound the alarms because you don't want to know the most terrifying thing about all of this is that all the people that fall into this trap, they don't know. That is one thing that across the board is a common denominator with them. They're all completely blind to it. And that is terrifying because to them, they think, you know, I said a prayer. I'm fine. Oh, I believe in my heart. I really believe Jesus is Lord. It's, it's fine. You know, I, I'm fine. But they're not spiritually pursuing Yeshua in relationship with him. They are not pursuing him. I'm going to tell you, the death of any marriage is when the spouses stop pursuing one another. It's the death of every marriage. You see people that have to come into counseling, it's, they, they, they stopped pursuing one another. The expectation of our relationship with Yeshua is but one thing. You never stop pursuing. You never stop it. You always continue. Because, you know, this concept of where you think you're, you know what, that, oh, you know, I've kind of been complacent in my faith and that everything's fine. There's no such thing as just kind of holding the line in the faith. You are either moving forward or you are falling away. There's no middle ground here. Now, we we don't like to hear that, but that's the truth. We like to tell ourselves everything is going to be fine. Guess what? Everything is not going to be fine. Everything is going to be hell. If you're carnal, that's the only expectation you have. Continuing on and going back to Hebrews 5 verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk. Okay, let's stop here for a second. What is the milk of the word? What is this milk that he's referring to? First and foremost, and we're going to see this next week because we're going to get into this on on a very deep level. But first and foremost, it's conceptual faith that Yeshua is Lord. It's your faith that through him you have salvation. It's your faith that you believe that he died, he suffered for your sins, and that the Father rose him from the grave. That's what this milk is. We could add to that, well, it's in a mikvah. You go through the death, burial, and resurrection of, of Yeshua. We could add this baptism to it. This is the milk. Okay? So for everyone who partakes only of milk, what are they? They are unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. They are unskilled. Now some people, and I say this because I'm not making this up. Some people look at this, well, it's unskilled in the word of righteousness. We're not talking about salvation here. 
It's just we're not unskilled with righteousness. It's not that bad of a thing, you know, because I said, well, let's continue and read. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Do you want to understand the importance of being skilled in the word of righteousness and why you need to? Do you think it's important as a Christian, as a believer in Yeshua, to know the difference between good and evil? Yes. It makes all the difference in the world. Do you understand why the devil would never want churches to go past the milk of the word? Why he would never want them to be fed with any solid food? So that you can have entire buildings filled with people that don't know their left hand from their right. Entire buildings filled with not being able to discern truly between good and evil. And that way the devil can come in. And he can start passing stuff off. And you know what? I'm going to whisper in the ears of the pastor. I'm going to whisper in the, in, into the ears of the congregants that, you know what? They need to start incorporating this, this and this into the worship service. We should start putting this on the worship team. We should start doing these particular activities. We should be bringing this and that into the community. And everyone's going, yeah, I think that's a great idea. We should become more inventive on how we get the gospel out. They come up with all these ideas, and nobody knows. They sound good. See, what did Isaiah warn us of? In Isaiah 5.20, he warned us. He said people would come, and they would call good evil and evil good. That should terrify you. We are living in those days where good is being called evil, and evil is being called good. And that is in the church. Think about this. Do you think it matters? Do you think it's important in regard to deception to know these two things? That we need to have believers skilled in the word of righteousness to come up to protect one another? Absolutely. You know, this is what makes the seeker-sensitive um, movement, which is so popular today, so very dangerous. Because they're in this revolving door, this perpetual state of milk. Week after week, the pastor comes, brings the same message. Week after week, they never grow. The buildings are filled with those who are suckling milk alone. And there is no growth. And you know what? The people that are cutting their teeth, they're leaving. I've seen it. I've literally seen interviews that, you know what? We don't go here. And I've talked to other people. We used to go here. And I know the church that they used to go to, the seeker sensitive church. And you know what? We had to leave it because we're not getting anything there anymore. There's no milk. So what are you left with? You're left with an entire building, 10,000 people that don't know their right hand from their left, and all the people that want the meat, that need, that have cut their teeth, and that they need to go deeper in the word, they're all gone. There's nothing there. This is terrifying. But it's all under the guise of, you know what, well, we're seeker sensitive. And we got to reach the people nobody else is reaching for the gospel. And I'll be honest, there's, there are particular ministries that are being called, they're niche ministries for that. But I cannot find anywhere where we are not to have spiritual growth and discipleship. There is no such thing. And yet, this is the new modern take on Christianity. And it's absolutely pillaging the faith. It's destroying. It's sending more people to hell than all the bars in America. As Leonard Ravenhill said. I mean, this is the reality. With that said, I, I want to show you some passages that reveal... The expectation for believers when they come into the faith. And the fact that it, we are, to, the, the whole expectation is to grow. And it, it is nothing, there's no other expectation but that. 2 Peter 1.5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to it. I highlighted it. See, because the, the, the mantra today is you can't add anything to your faith. Yeshua did it all so you don't have to. You have nothing to do. Just believe. This is what we're being told. The Bible is telling me different. Add to your faith. What do we add? Virtue. To virtue, knowledge. We must add knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. Perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness, love. Love is the goal. Love is the ultimate goal. You are going to have to add to your faith. If anyone is telling you you're not to add to your faith, this conceptual belief that Yeshua is Lord, they are deceivers. And they are deceived themselves. 
And Peter goes on. He's going to go on and listen to this because he's going to show you how important this growth is. So when I tell you it is the difference between life and death, you, you understand this is true. I'm not making it up. For if these things are yours and abound, we're to abound in the faith, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Messiah Yeshua. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old uh, sins. Think about that statement. You do not grow. What are you? Peter comes out and said, you're virtually blind. You will suffer from blindness. Again, you will, because you won't know how to discern between good and evil. And you have forgotten what Yeshua did on the cross. Now I think about that, you are called to pursue. We have to pursue the Messiah Yeshua. Absence of growth is total spiritual blindness. Let me take you to my favorite passage on this. It's one I cover a lot. It's in Philippians 1.9. The Apostle Paul says this, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. We're to grow. Your love is to abound. But how? Look at this. And knowledge and all discernment. For Christians. Okay, here you have a Jew speaking to these Gentile believers. And he just told them, your love must abound. And it must abound two ways. And he's very specific. Knowledge and discernment. Now, here's the real kicker. These terms are explicitly a reference to the Torah. To the law of God. You know, it's interesting in light of that we are living in a Christianity that has literally thrown out the Torah. They want nothing to do. It has nothing to do with Christ. It has everything to do with pursuing him. It has everything to do with relationship with him. It has everything to do with the expectation of you coming into the faith and you being with him. It's to pursue that. To support this, I want to show you this because this is too often missed. This word knowledge, let me take you to Hosea. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Think about that statement. Do you think it's important that you add to your faith, as Peter says, knowledge? Yes. When Paul says that our love is to bound still more and more in knowledge, there's a reason. Absence of it, my people will be destroyed. Because the enemy will come in, and he will deceive you. You will not see him coming, because you do not have the eyes of the living God. You need his eyes. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. Now, this is a statement you got to see. When you look at rejecting knowledge, this term knowledge is used synonymously with that of law. To reject knowledge is to forget the law of God. It's to forget the Torah. What is the devil doing? What is he doing in this generation? He's going after the knowledge of God. Take the knowledge of God away from the believers. Coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And it, to the point where he will literally forget our children. Now, going back to Philippians and looking at this. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more and knowledge and all discernment. And I could take you after passage after passage in regard to this term discernment. But all we need to do is even go, what do we read in Hebrews 4.12? For the word of God is living and powerful. We know this is a direct statement to the Torah, to the word. And it is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Where does discernment come? It comes from his word. This is how we get discernment. And so this is what we're to grow. We're to grow in the word of the Lord. Now, continuing on, he's not done. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Messiah. So why do we need to abound in the Torah? Why do we need to abound in the knowledge of the Lord in his word? So that we can properly approve the things that are excellent. And just as a side note here, that term that Paul uses, this, this phrase, approving the things that are excellent, he uses this phrase explicitly in the context of Torah. And let me show you. I'll put this up here with this. 
In Romans 2, 17, indeed, you are called a Jew. You rest on the law. You make your boast in God. You know his will. Oh, and you approve the things that are excellent. Now, what does he say next? Being instructed out of the law, out of the Torah. This is how we approve the things that are excellent. This is the knowledge that we are called to possess that the devil doesn't want you to have. Colossians 1, 9. We read this, for this uh, reason, we also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask uh, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Do you see over and over? I could go to so many epistles. This is the concept. This is the heart of Paul in his introduction in the, to the Philippians, in his introduction to the Colossians. We are to be filled with the knowledge of his will. And look at what he says here. He's very specific. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. See, because that's what it's about. It's about work, walking worthy of the cross. I love what Leonard Ravenhill says, are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? And you think about that statement. It puts you in check immediately. We're to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing. Now, I want to take you to the Torah. Because what I want to show you is that this statement that the Apostle Paul makes of being of wisdom and understanding and the, the, the structure that he has laid out here. He did not make this up on his own. He's literally extrapolating. He's pulling it out of the Torah. Let me take you there and show you what it says. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgment just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. In other words, this is Moses talking to Israel. You know, the Lord gave me your, the, all the commandments. And I have given them to you. You better listen to them. You better do these things when, when you go into that land. Why? Now look at what he says in verse 6. Therefore be careful to observe them. Oh, for this is your wisdom and your understanding. And the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. In other words, the commandments that are given in God's Torah, in His law, that is wisdom and understanding. That is the very thing the Apostle Paul just got done saying. In Colossians, we're to be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and and spiritual understanding. See, if you want to truly understand what the Torah is in its deepest sense, simply put, and I was challenged on this. I was put on the spot many, many years ago. And someone came up to me and said, Dan, I'm just this older gal with a little crazed look in her eye. Uh, it was interesting. But she comes up and she tells, she, she asks, in five words, tell me what the Torah is right now. And I just thought about it, and it was, it was only by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I just came up, it's the will of God. Because that's what it is. It is the will of God. I want to take you to Revelation 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. Why did I put this on the screen? You need to understand the importance of having wisdom and understanding. The only way you will spot the spirit of the Antichrist and understand and identify who the Antichrist is, is if you have wisdom and understanding. That is the only way. You think it might be important that you start pursuing the knowledge of the Lord. And you don't pursue it simply for knowledge. You are reading it. You're learning to do it so that we apply it to our lives. Amen? Show you a couple other passages. A wise man will hear, and what will they do? They will increase learning. They're pursuing their master, Yeshua, because they're in love with him. They don't want anything else. They want to pursue him, their husband. You increase in learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma. And I'm going to tell you something. Scripture is filled with proverbs and enigma. Yeshua's teachings were filled. They were proverbs. They were enigmas. And so to understand a proverb and enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And what is Tortor is instruction. We are not to be fools. We are not to despise it. Proverbs 16, 23, the heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. We add, we add. We don't sit and stagnate. We don't sit and become complacent because that means you're falling away. We pursue Yeshua with everything we got. Proverbs 15, 14, the heart of him who has understanding, what does he do? He seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on foolishness. And this is not talking about the wisdom of the world. This is not talking about becoming, uh, getting your PhD in psychology and astrophysics, anything like that. This is talking about entering into God's word, becoming knowledgeable about spiritual things. This is what we're called to. Proverbs 9, 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wiser. Teach a just man, and what will he do? He will increase in learning. I mean, no matter where you go in Scripture, this is being told over and over and over again. Psalm 25, verse 4. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation, and on you I wait all the day. What a heart. You want to see the heart of the Lord? This man is broken before the Lord. And we go to Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. See, the heart who's pursuing Yeshua is crying out, Lord, I beg of you, open the Torah. Open up your words. Open up those teachings, Yeshua, that I've read about you. Open them up. You desire nothing more. You understand that they're better than gold. Yea, than fine gold. This is the heart of the righteous. You are crying out for this. Ephesians 5, 8, Paul says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now the fruit of the Spirit, okay, this is the fruit of the Spirit. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. This is our responsibility. This is the expectation. We must seek what pleases the Lord. We need to find out what is acceptable to Him. If you do not seek, you will not know. And if you continue to take your flesh and and to be governed by your flesh, it will pull you away from the word every single time without exception. I'm telling you this. When you you know you're supposed to be fasting and praying and you're not listening to the Spirit, you have a problem. When you know and you feel that that Spirit prodding you, that Holy Spirit. I'm going to close with this. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. If you do not pursue holiness, you will never see the Lord. I think of this statement, and what a statement to end on. Terrifying. We are to pursue holiness. And I got to tell you, and we were talking about it this morning. Isn't it interesting? Nothing is more hated than God's holiness today. I have never, I could never imagine a generation of churches that hold such contempt for the Torah. That hold such contempt against his law. They're offended when you go to keep the Shabbat. They're offended. This is a commandment of God and the church has become repulsed by commandments that you can read with your own two eyes written on stone tablets. We're in trouble. Well, you do not want to be taken with this sea of deception because it is a very powerful undercurrent. Have you ever been in the ocean? Have you ever experienced that undercurrent? It is deadly. It is so powerful. It will sweep you out. You don't want to get caught in that undercurrent.